Welcome to Cast Wolf Radio, the Brazen Broadcast, a free-to-download legacy podcast not intended for match to play. With me today, I have Reva. Hey, guys. Chitskoy. Good morning. And today we have a special guest. Freed from his stone curse and presumably walking around on steam-powered legs, we have CDO's founder and original source of profit, Xander. How's it going? It's good to get us all around the microphone. There's lots and lots to talk about. It's been a while since we did one of these. Uh, first up, I think we should have a little catch up. Um, I've been playing quite a bit of the old world recently. I uh, don't want to get into that into too much detail because we're we'll going into quite a lot of detail about the old world soon. But yeah, just started an old world campaign using uh, the old My- Mighty Empire tiles. So I've been getting into that. Been rebasing Chaos Warriors and I've been painting up my extremely large backlog of uh, Big Hat Chaos Dwarfs. But I've been doing a really good job of keeping the backlog stable by buying just as much as I'm painting. That's the plan. Nice. You guys, uh, Reva, what have you been up to, man? Not too much in the way of gaming, but been trying to chase through a bunch of uh, basically all war machines. I actually kind of took an inventory. I've got no infantry units left for any of my armies, so I am in paint the big things mode for the foreseeable future, which has been a lot of fun. Timed well with the golden hat, I suppose. So I'll, I'll take that. Um, but yeah, other than that, trying to stave off buying things, but it's not going so well. <laughs> How are you looking in the bat G, Reva? Oh, pretty dead even, I would say. I've uh, yeah, I managed to float at like negative two or something like that. But it's uh, it's it's uh, slow going painting things that are on monstrous monstrous infantry or above. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Very good, very good. Uh, and Ken, since you've uh, you, you've moved to the other side of the world, haven't you, mate? Do you want to talk to us a bit about what you've been up to? I have indeed. How's it going, everyone? Uh, yeah, it, in case you don't hang out in the, the Discord um, or pay close attention to my discourse blogs, um, I have moved to Seoul, South Korea, um, which is very much Gundam territory. Um, <laughs> I think we've been able to identify two Warhammer stockists nationally. Um, and one of them is a COVID paranoid recluse shut in who shut down his shop and does online only. However, I was able to get my copy of uh, the old world and also a copy of Ravening Hordes. Um, but I'm back to the old days of the pandemic. I'm a paper hobbyist again. Um, in the interim, I've been playing a lot of second edition with Jack and the gang. Um, that's second edition 40k, you understand, uh, mostly with squats. Um, but now that I've moved to Korea, obviously, I have uh, only got two armies coming with me. Um, they won't arrive until April. So I've still got, as of time of recording, about a month before I can do any proper hobbying. But those armies are going to be uh, green skins for the old world, um, which is going to be a bit of a, a kind of a basing challenge to make sure they're all on appropriate separators. Um, and then... Uh, I've got my Hashit Iron Warriors project coming soon to a batchy backlog near you, um, where I'm going to be taking a kind of Warhammer 30,000 uh, Horus Heresy army um, and using bits from the Horns of Hashit to make a Chaos Cultist group, um, and also, yeah, a bunch of Iron Warriors who worship Hashit. That's a very cool idea, and I've seen some of your, uh, some of your work in progress builds there, man. It's been very, very cool. Very cool indeed. All right, nice one. And uh, Xander, what have you been up to, mate? I've been up to so much. I'm just exhilarated um, with Warhammer the Old World. Like, um, I had been collecting Dark Elves all fall, just a bunch of kits, because I knew that they were going to sell out immediately when this game dropped. And so by the time it did come out, I just was all set. I made this huge Dark Elf army. I built it in like five weeks. It's got a dragon theme. It's got dragon chariots instead of cold one chariots and um it's it's been super cool i've been doing that i rebased the whole entire warriors of chaos army that i never painted and now i'm starting a new chaos dwarf army so i'm i'm back i'm like really back i've been on the forums i've been on the discourse i've been on the patreon i've been everywhere on chaos dwarves online just sort of resuming where i left off since fantasy died and it's it's been really awesome 
really cool. It's really cool, man. And I think I think that's something we're going to see quite a uh, quite a lot of. There'll, there'll be some people who kind of moved to alternative games. There'll be some people that kind of like mm. plugged away playing eighth. There'll be some people who who kind of like dropped off really, and now they're kind of coming back. And I do think something I've noticed is there's been something of a of a galvanizing of of the community mm. once again because you know love it or hate it, Warhammer is the biggest game in town, and and if Warhammer's good again, people are going to want to be on it, and that's that's. It's nice that we can once again kind of have a, a lingua franca on the forum. You know, when you say, I'm putting together a Chaos Dwarf list, you don't have to have a preamble of what edition and what system and all that kind of stuff. People know you're talking about Chaos Dwarfs in the old world unless you sell otherwise. Yep, absolutely. Very good. So let's talk about the old world then, gentlemen, because this mm-hmm. is something that I can think back to the early days of this podcast, which I think is pushing about three years ago now where we were first getting those rumblings about the old world and the kind of the meme and the joke was that um, it was never coming, it was really, really slow, et cetera, et cetera. But we didn't quite realise um, how accurate that actually was. I don't know if you guys share with me, but I had almost like a level of disbelief about it ever actually coming out. A uh, friend of mine, Luke, who I play a lot of Warhammer with, um, he hit the nail on the head with me. Even, even on pre-order day, he said, I've ordered it. And he said, I still don't believe it's going to happen. <laughs> if if the parcel's open and it's a it's a poster of a stormcast, uh, give me a middle finger. I'll just say yeah, fa- fair play, Games Workshop. Great, great joke. I, I appreciate it. Well, it almost didn't happen. I mean, it sold out everywhere. Not everyone got a chance to actually order what they wanted. And even in my case, where I did get a chance to order what I wanted, uh, there was huge shipping delays in in the Americas. Like I didn't mm. see my product for at least two weeks till after launch. So it was weird. It was a weird launch. I think if, if rumour is to be believed, the whole project has been in development for years and years and years. So they talk about the, the idea going back to 2018. So less than two years into Age of Sigma, they started talking about this in a serious way, presumably because they could see that everyone was playing square-based games and Mantic was running a square-based business, you know, down the yeah, road in Nottingham. Wasn't the, the announcement like the week of like Kings of War yes. or something? Yes, there's a there's a thinking of War three, I think. But yeah, yeah. There's a lot of corporate stuff um, that that we think is also behind the fact the legacy PDFs are really high quality, uh, because mm-hmm. in the original project they were intended to eventually be army books, um, and so that's why they've got like proper special rules and lots of effort went into them because they are old drafts of what would have been additional factions in the supplements, and then Big Daddy. Uh, GW kind of stepped in and said you need to limit this project and limit the scope but then actually demand has massively outstripped supply and I think yeah the thing that's so interesting that people have been talking about Xander that you mentioned is that demand has has stayed really high in the legacy PDF space so Mm -hmm. Dark Elves are a great example but like you correctly predicted they all sold out and you know it's obvious that that range is intended to be replaced by new AOS sculpts at some point in the new AOS edition. And yet, I hope GW can respond to the very clear commercial information that they should keep making those miniatures and selling them. Um, but it's going to take years for them to digest that information. And we've got to make sure the old world is going well in the meantime, right? And even before the or- old world came out, you know, they have all sorts of supply issues on their website. Things are just out of stock for armies everywhere, even in AOS. So it's kind of, I mean, people are talking about them maybe spinning up another production site maybe in america or something but they just can't they just can't make manufacture sprues fast enough no they can't they really really can't i mean even if you were after quite mainstream armies you know and quite mainstream games you click the little tab to say notify me when in when in stock again and you can be waiting months and months and months Mm -hmm. Uh, a buddy of mine had it for um one of the undead armies in age of sigma um might be like vargulfs or something like that and he had he had it in his you know, notify me, went in, and it notified him, went in. He was uh, at work at the time, and he thought, ah, oh, when I get home from work, I'll make sure I buy a box. And by the time he got home from work, it sold out again. Yeah, it had gone again. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, you know, I know scalping is a big topic in the community, but I don't think that scalping is hugely going on with old world boxes. Um, one of the things that is interesting, though, is that I have seen some preposterous prices for the uh, Tomb Kings launch box on eBay, which is stupid, because it's not out of production. Uh, and just because it's currently out of stock, like it came back into stock in the UK yesterday, for instance, because I got the notification about it. I had I had the magic cards, the cards for the magic and the magic items in my 
in my checkout, you know, basket or whatever. And I, <laughs> I did not buy them in the end. And uh, I feel a bit silly because they sold out and now they're like crazy expensive. So, well, one important thing I think for us to remember is that, you know, when GW sells out for something, they start thinking immediately about how they can sell it again. Um, and I think from that perspective, like there is something to be said for viewing these things in as positive a light as possible. I know that people get very frustrated with the company. No one is more frustrated with the company than a Chaos Dwarf fan. Um, but when you get down to it, ultimately, like the more demand there is, the more supply there will eventually be. Patient war gamers are often war gamers who save themselves hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, Xander, have you had a chance to play Old World yet, mate? Yes. So I've been playing a lot, which is actually kind of a change for me. I, I'm usually more of a hobbyist. And um, when this game came out, I wanted very explicitly to be playing the game uh, right from the start. So I was actually collecting up, you know, people who I had actually done a Necromunda campaign with um, before the pandemic, which was, you know, the campaign was ruined by the pandemic. But, you know, now that things have settled down and uh, I knew these guys were into old, like, fantasy. So I got, we got three other guys. We got a solid group of four people. We're all building armies. We're all playing games. We're all practicing the rules. We're all talking about lists. And so I've done that. I also went to the first tournament, maybe. I don't know. They were saying when I went there, it was the first, like, ranked one or whatever. I don't know the, the actual terminology, but it was in Barrie, Ontario. And, uh... I even played against a YouTuber uh, whose name, Scary. that's it. And um, so I had a really good time there, played three games there, and everyone was just having a blast. It was like the first or second week since the game like launched practically, so it was really cool to see everyone just fumbling through the rules and having a good time and no one really <laughs> caring that, uh, you know, that miniatures weren't painted or anything. And everyone was just having an awesome time. So I've been playing a lot, and it's it's been great. And I'm also going to Adepticon next week to play in two separate tournaments. So I'll be playing a bunch of games there, and I'll also be playing in a Teams tournament. That's the second event that I'm playing in, and I'm playing it with an old Chaos Dwarves online member, Swiss Dictator. So it's going to be awesome. And Jack, I mean, that kind of begs the question, right? You've been playing a lot as well. Um, I wonder if you guys, because I think it's fair to say Jared, um, <laughs> Jared and I are in slightly different situations, right? Uh, I myself, I've got the rule books next to me, but I need to create a play group. I've got the beginnings of that, thanks to Chaos Dwarfs Online, um, but it's going to be a long road. And I need my minis to get with me and need a gaming board and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then Jared, your perspective on the old world's a bit different, isn't it? Slightly, I would say. Um, I was just doing a bit of homework on the side and I would say the last time I purchased a book within a living system was 2004's Lord of the Rings strategy battle game Siege of Gondor. So that's 20 years. That's 20 awesome. years. Uh, so in the lull between Warhammer Fantasy ending and AOS going, I eventually sort of got over myself and I said, okay, I'm going to try Age of Sigmar. And the thing that really spurred me to action was the the Cities of Sigmar list, which finally put humans in the setting. And I was inspired by Chris Peach's army uh, of of humans, and it was really awesome. Like, he had, you know, scraped together all the different Warhammer kits that were relevant to that list and made this awesome army. And I thought, okay, I can do the same. And I scrounged my whole collection. I built the Cities of Sigmar list. And, you know, the project probably took me about 18 months, which is like, which is like a record for me to make a 2,000-point army. And... And then almost immediately when I was done, I played like one or two games and then a brand new battle tome came out, replaced <laughs> my whole army. The whole army is practically obsolete. They replaced <laughs> the aesthetic, they replaced the units. And, uh, you know, it just goes to show you like, you've got about a two year window with most of these Fuck books. Fuck living systems. They're just going to get completely replaced. Fuck living systems. They, they, I had a very similar experience of Age of Sigmar as well, um, where I was kind of dragged. I, I played Age of Sigmar quite a bit upon its early release. Um, but then I I was dragged back into it a little while later by a buddy who was saying like you will you will enjoy it you know it, it's not it's not the best system in the world I know it's not really your cup of tea but it's about who you play with and and how you're playing or and, and I'm a firm believer in that do you know what I mean if I'm playing yep. noughts and crosses with the right person I'll have a good time you know but it 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 was the fact that I was like all right I'm doing Heed Knights of Slanesh the Heed Knights of Slanesh book has come out. They've got these really cool Slanesh mortals. I bought them. I based them. I painted them. I even bought the little unit cards and the dice and everything. 
and then that that didn't last two years. That was like a year later before they had like a new version of their t- battle tome. Yeah, and all of their units had changed, and all those unit cards I got were useless. And I mean, even even the battle tome I got by the time it was printed and was in my hand, there was already FAQs on the internet um, making the magic less powerful because it apparently had come out and it was really really broken. Maybe hadn't been play tested very well or something like that. And it was just painful. And, it, and this is this is where I, I I don't understand the argument when I see some people online going um oh the old world's out but you'll, you'll be lucky you'll be lucky to get a couple of releases a year i just think to myself <laughs> oh i really hope that's true paradise i really yeah, paradise. hope that's true i mean i mean what a classy way to publish yeah ruin it slower all, all the army <laughs> lists on release all the army lists on release you know what minis are going to come out there's no fake hype cycle right because you know what's on the chaos dwarfs roster you know what's on the um green skins roster if you're playing a live faction if you're playing a, a dead faction then go on fuck off do your hobbying make what you want do what you want what a classy way to run a system i really no, believe perfect. that it's perfect. the flaws yeah and plus on top of that right so we've got all the starting army lists everyone's on an equal footing and yeah. the way they're going to do it is when we release quote unquote army books they're not army books they're supplements and they just give you more options for your army already. Mm-hmm. So we've got the That's battalion it. one, we've got the two kings one, and they just get additional benefits. It's not replacing anything that came before. It's just here's some other options you have, and that's amazing. Little themed armies, special units, special characters, stuff that sort of thing, like sprinkling that in. That's really cool. It yeah. won't mean that you know a Bretonian book comes out and fundamentally changes what Bretonians are. It'll be like, oh, here's a fun way to play with your Bretonian army. I mean, how cool is yeah. that? I mean, that that's that's cool. that's the way to go. From the border princes, that's really cool. It, it takes them. If it, it takes it. them three years to get through the seven armies or whatever they've got here, I don't bloody care. That's fine because the product mm-hmm. on release is good. The product is good. Yeah. It works. It's a it's a well play tested, pretty balanced, decent system. And I say pretty balanced because. I would not be playing in hyper competitive meta sort of situations. I'd be playing with with buddies doing narrative games and stuff, which you know wonky systems would would potentially ruin fun. But it's a solid enough system that a casual gamer is just going to have a real fun game with it. Well, I think that's kind of the natural segue. If um, if Jared and I make some space for you and Xander to to spurg out about how the game actually works, um, I just want to add my factoid. Right, there are two hundred and fifty three pages of rules in that rule book. And that doesn't include the faction-specific special rules that you've got to learn if you're playing, especially a, a heavy special rule faction like an undead faction or demons or something. Um, so it's a huge ask of a lot of gamers. Much of it is familiar, but much of it has been changed. And as we all know with square-based systems, if you change a small thing like initiative or um, the way that combat resolution works, or the choices that players are forced to make in certain situations, then it has a massive impact on the game system, as any historical Warhammer fan who's played multiple editions of fantasy will tell you. From that perspective, do you guys just want to kind of tell us what your early games have felt like, how you made your way through those rules, and what you've noticed about the system compared to the systems that you've played in the past? Um, I think the first thing I would say is that it's Warhammer. Like, is, this is no, no one's reinvented the wheel here. Warhammer is a game that has evolved. It's not. It's, it's not had kind of big revolutionary shifts in its in its journey as a game system. If you think about a game like Warhammer Forty Thousand, for example, Rogue Trader is one game. Second edition is another game. Third up to um, seventh is a whole different game. Eighth onwards is a new game. You know, it, it re- that's a game that has had its DNA rewritten many times. Whereas Warhammer Fantasy Battles has very much more had incremental changes over time. Yeah, I think if you look at like the stat line for a human, it's been the exact same almost the entire time, I think. Absolutely. And I think I think that's where you, you pick up this game and you start rolling dice and very, very quickly you go, Well, this is this is Warhammer, isn't it? I know I know what I'm doing here. I mean, it does have pitfalls that come with it, because as a person who's played a previous edition, you might go oh, I know what I'm doing. Oh, fuck, I don't actually know what I'm doing. I'm actually accidentally using a rule from 8th or something here, you know, because 
that that's where some of those, as you say, it's like some of those nuances have changed, some of the special rules have changed, some of the ways you do things have changed. But that's that's my my big first impression is that this is Warhammer, and if you like playing Warhammer, you will like playing this. You know, I think the next thing you notice right away as soon as you're building your army list is the model count has been greatly diminished. And I would say even diminished more than 6th edition, where 6th edition, it was very common for us to be running 25 unit strong of Chaos Dwarves. And now, honestly, when I'm building a 2,000 point list, I'm struggling to get to a unit of 20 Chaos Dwarves in, you know, in, in one unit. My shooting units are like units of 10. My other units are units of 15 or 20, maybe. And you're looking at maybe two or three Chaos Dwarf units only in a list. The model count is way under 100. It's probably closer to like 60 or something. And when you compare that with what 8th edition was doing to the game and driving model counts such that, you know, units of Night Goblins were 100 models, you know, of themselves. Um, I, I think this is really positive. I really was hoping that this was going to be the case where building a 2,000 point army was an affordable enterprise where you could encourage people to get into the game. And with, you know, where the prices are, especially for Games Workshop models, um, the eighth edition model was just completely unsustainable in light of those prices. So I'm really happy to see the model count uh, drop. Yeah. And I think the depressing thing you've always got to remember about eighth edition is that the writers of the game went into it knowing that it was going to be the final edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. It was, um, it was, it was during the end of seventh they knew that this was going to be its swan song, as it were. And there is a bit of a, a thing with eighth of. It was a game to to go mental with and smash together as many models as possible and everything got very high fantasy and very crazy and stuff towards the end whereas i think this thing's you know has brought us back down to to earth a little bit i find where i i run obviously chaos dwarfs but an army that i run more often than chaos dwarfs is chaos warriors and what i have found is that they very very much more like feel like tough humans as opposed to gods and supermen they felt like an ape yeah, certainly for regular Chaos Warriors, people are saying, well, regular, regular Chaos Warriors aren't really the Chaos Warriors we used to know. They're, they're more like what you said, really tough guys, but it's really the Chosen that are now the new Chaos Warrior. Oh, absolutely, the Chosen handle, just like Chaos Warriors did in Aeth, but it's quite nice now that you have that distinction and you can kind of mm -hmm. make those choices about these are the blokes who are on the cusp of becoming a Chaos Lord almost, and these are the guys who, I don't know, they've just got their suit of armour and they've just walked out of Norska ready to split some heads. They're two very different people. Um, but yeah, I have, I've enjoyed the game a lot. I think I think there's some cool things about about the game that I've liked. I like the, um, the way that, that, that um, combat's move. I like the giving ground and the falling back in good order. I don't know how you feel about that, Xander. Yeah, I think it's something new to grapple with. Um, but in general, I find it good. I mean, I've, I've always felt that, you know, you charge a unit, you do like five wound, you know, five casualties in the front rank in prior editions when you couldn't strike back. You know, this is pre-8th. And you didn't get to attack back. You lost combat. You fled. They trampled you over. It felt bad, you know, when you just painted up 20 goblins or something yeah, and, yeah. and never even got a chance to do anything with them. They just got run over completely. So I, I think this is bringing a, a measure of of ebb and flow to the combat where it's like, Definitely. yeah, they charged. Maybe they killed a bunch of goblins, but you didn't, you, your whole unit didn't just fall apart. You know, you fell back a bit, which kind of makes sense. They're pushing you back, you know, your your unit's falling back. And that's going to have ramifications. Now your line is open to flank charges and other things, and it's got an impact on the game. But you didn't you didn't lose your whole unit in one shot. Yeah, definitely. And and, and being a fan of, of kind of ancient history and stuff like that, when when you read the reports of of those ancient battles, that's that was it was that that push and shove and to and fro of blocks of infantry that. And I know, I know uh, Warhammer's always been a bit silly, really, because you have 10 or 20 men walking around as a unit of 500 men might have walked around in ancient times. You know, in real life, 10 or 20 men don't go, right, boys, we have to stand in the exact square block now. Don't you dare put one step out. You know? <laughs> so it, it's a little bit silly in that respect. But it does, it does I think, now better um, simulate that kind of pushing and shoving. And as you say, uh, Xander, your line's kind of um, changing. And th that way... The, the landscape of the battlefield can suddenly look quite different to what it did a turn before and open up new tactical opportunities, but also open you up to outflanks and 
and, and things like that. I mean, how do you feel about the new magic? Because that's quite a departure from 8th, isn't it? Yeah. Honestly, I, I don't think I played too much 8th edition. I, I, I think I have the rules. I think I read them. Uh, I heard a lot about, you know, the purple sun just destroying everything. Oh, goodness me, yeah. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, I'm happy that it's toned down. Uh, Magic has always felt like a separate game inside the game, and I know some people think that's enjoyable and that's fun. Um, but it always felt like whenever I was playing a new edition of Warhammer, it's like, how does the magic work in this one? Because everything yeah. else kind of remained the same, but magic was always something totally different from edition to edition. And this one kind of, it's sort of incorporated into the game a little more, and it, it feels more natural in the sense that, okay, you know, if you're going to be doing movement spells, you're doing it in the movement phase, and that's going to help you in the movement phase. If you're doing shooting, you're going to shoot your magic missile in the shooting phase. And if you're doing a combat spell, you know, you're going to do that in the combat phase. And it kind of makes sense, although I, I, I must admit that I've been forgetting to, like, I think everyone has. You know, you're moving phases, and you're switching, and you're like, oh, crap, I didn't do my buff spell or my hex spell. Yeah, and yeah. That, and they're like, yeah, it's fine. Let's do that because you know everyone wants that second chance when we're learning the rules. But you know, it's taking some getting used to. But I think overall, I think it's a benefit. I think you know, there's some talk that a level four in a two thousand point game is like you, it's necessary. That extra plus four to casting rules and dispel rules is really important. Um, so it's interesting. But there's this. There's also this interesting element where it's you know you have to be in range. You know, eighteen inches for smaller mages and 24 for level three, four mages. And also, I mean, you can just straight up charge into combat with something that's flying or whatever, some of these mages, and you can kind of take them offline. So there's, there's a lot of ways to, to interact with magic in ways that you couldn't before, you know, using melee, using uh, tactics, you can like, so for example, I was playing in this game and um, I had a Supreme Sorceress on a Dark Pegasus. Um, my opponent was orcs and goblins. They cast like the foot of Mork. They put it like right in front of my cold ones and also my sorcerer. And I managed not to dispel it. And then on my turn, when it scattered, it scattered into my sorceress and completely obliterated my level four sorceress in one shot. He got, you know, he got some good rolls. And I'm like, what am I going to do now? Like, am I just totally screwed? I have no level four mage and he's got a level four wizard. And what I did was I charged his wizard with my dragon that turn. And I kind of took his magic offline and started beating on the unit that it was in. And it, it was okay. You know, it turned out there was, a, there, there was a strategy left for me to to employ, even though my level four had been destroyed. So I think there's a lot of interesting avenues to explore when it comes to magic and how it works. And, yes, uh, certainly. I think, I think that whole thing you were talking about there, when, when, a, when a wizard's in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they, they are not able to do an awful lot. That they, they still be able to have some assailment spells or something. No, that's about to get those off. Uh, and yeah, some you can't dispel and you can't cast unless it's a combat spell, right? There's so much you can't do. But um, I, I, something I've, I never used in 8th edition, but I'm finding myself using a little bit more now, is the spellcaster not mm. attached to a unit. It's, I've got two blocks of Chaos Warriors running around, and in between them is a little lone sorcerer chucking out fireballs yeah. and stuff, you know? I, and that's got a place now, because if he's in a big block of Chaos Warriors, that Chaos Warriors... Every moment that they are not punching right. someone is a, is a moment wasted. But if that wizard's in there punching someone, he's being wasted. And I've, I've found, I've surprised myself really at, at running that. And I find it quite aesthetically pleasing because to me, it looks like the old white dwarf pictures. They'd always have the heroes right. separate out of the units, wouldn't they? Yeah. And I, well, yeah, I think there's, um, <clears throat> and, and I appreciate I'm coming at this from a paper hammer perspective, right? I haven't played with some of these things but i think that um magic it's it looks like a tool in the toolkit um that you need to have you should have an answer for it um if your opponent brings it the thing that i think is interesting as a design choice that has changed things significantly is the random generation of spells um, especially given that you don't have to take randomly generated spells because you can substitute them for a choice out of your kind of faction law um, if you decide to. Um, a signature spell, exactly. And I just wanted to kind of put that on the table for you guys and question it. Like, what do you guys think about that? Because given how powerful some spells are... I think it's good. I, I think... You know, when you think of a wizard, you think of someone casting a spell on an enemy unit and causing damage, right? It's kind of like a shooting unit. 
And it could very easily happen in past editions where you have a level two or something and you roll some spells and you get these spells that are just really not applicable to the opponent you're playing or, or, or the strategy that you have. And you just, you're, you're sort of, you know, that's it. There's bad luck for you, I guess. And by having these signature spells that all really seem to be kind of like magic missiles, more or less, um, it really allows you to default to these spells. And it's, it's nice. And it's only one spell, honestly. And the random generation spell, you know, the random generation of spells in particular, I don't think it's that big a deal, especially if it's four spells. You always have the option to take, uh, was it a lore familiar where you can choose your spells? You can spend those points if you really want to and have the yeah. exact choice. Or if you're in like chaos or something, you can take a familiar, you know, magic item where you get an extra spell. So you have five out of six, which I mean, that's pretty close in games where I've been playing um, with that setup. I just roll a dice to see which spell I don't have, really, because there's only six to choose. From, so it's a lot faster to do it that way. <laughs> Yeah, and when in doubt, my favorite item in the entire book, the Ruby Ring of Ruin. <laughs> you guarantee yeah. at least get a fireball off. Listen, one, one of the challenges, I think, with a, a, a system this large and complicated is that I think a lot of players look for a crutch. And I think the first crutch that most people have been looking for is like a net list. So if I talk about what we've observed on CDO since the Old World launch, we've had a big uptick in threads and posts of people asking questions like, what mm -hmm. is the best formation to put mm. my infernal guard in? And they're asking that question because they're coming from systems where there is an objective, yeah. correct answer to that question, and you have to stack the buffs. And so they want to know, what's the shape of regiment that stacks the most buffs so that I win? And hopefully, there will not be a correct answer to that question because it will be so contextual based on who you're facing and what terrain you're dealing with and what the tactical situation is for you as a general and so that's what we've been saying to people but i think that impulse to try and solve for what are the best magic items per point unfortunately over time when a meta develops there are going to be auto includes and i think the first auto include that's worth observing that i've seen on cdo is the lamasu's beard standard everyone takes the Lamassu's beard standard in the lists that I've seen and people have talked about on their battle standard bearer. Um, and I think many magic items, Ruby Ring of Ruin is one that people talk about all the time because why would you not want to be able to cast a fireball? You know what I mean? It's just an automatically good thing. Do you want to say what that banner does? I'm actually not familiar with it. <laughs> so the Chaos Warf list I've built actually don't have battle standard bearers yet. Okay. So I'm Here's the, here's the uh, here's Lamassu's beard, guys. A unit carrying the Lamassu's beard has a 6 plus ward save against any wound suffered and gains the magic resistance negative 2 special rule. In addition, whilst within 6 inches of a model carrying this standard, friendly units have a 5 up save against any wounds suffered during the shooting phase and gain magic resistance negative 1. So what you have here is a bubble of negative mm. a bubble of five up ward saves in the shooting phase a little bit of magic resistance and if somebody gets old up in your shit you've still got a a six up ward save so uh, it's not to be sniffed at is it? it's quite a nice defensive banner and you know chaos dwarfs often the kind of chaos dwarf army i've run in the past has been quite a castly sort of list i feel like there's a place yeah. for that for me yeah i think you're right i think listening to that just now um yeah, you know, I'm building a, my Adepticon list, and I'm thinking, hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I'm going to be doing sort of gunline artillery strategy, which I think is what I'm aiming towards, it makes a lot of sense to have stuff that's good in the shooting phase, where you can just sit back, shoot your artillery. You know, I've got a a, a demon smith making sure my artillery rolls are all good and everything's good, and just that little bit extra to protect your chaos dwarves, which are huge points. Definitely, they're really. If it's if 15 to 20, you know, uh, dwarves, it, it's like, it's it pushes past 300 points really fast. And that's a lot of points for a single unit. So getting that kind of shooting uh, protection uh, is kind of nice. No, absolutely. And I, I think, yeah, 65 points. So it's, 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 it's not a massive investment for an army. And I do think it's going to be... Um... It's going to be one that you, you're going to see quite a lot. And I'm really, really pleased because one of my battle standard bearers is the one that um, I got from uh, Admiral's store, Admiral in Miniatures on Etsy. And it's one of um, Fugit Khan's um, miniatures. And I painted it with a giant cartoon beard on it using the Admiral uh, Miniatures logo. 
So to me, just it, it already feels like the Lamassu's beard is a good fit for that um, for that flag. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is. I would just say one last thing, which is at sixty-five points, it is actually the most expensive uh, Chaos Dwarf specific magic item. Um, although part of me thinks right. it's been priced like that specifically so that you have to take it on your BSB because any normal regiment has a points limit for uh, magic standards, yes, um, yeah. whereas the BSB obviously doesn't. Um, but at the same time, it makes sense because think about it, if you face anything with the word elf in it, if you face empire right you have expensive guys who need to survive the shooting phase and if the opponent is planning to major on the shooting phase then you want that ward save on your most valuable guys that's just natural yeah yeah that's one third less of them dying to shooting than, than would have been previously and that's 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 well worth having and i think i think that's a great take but yeah just to, to finish yeah. the wider point right i think i think over time People are going to iterate the lists. I think Chaos Dwarfs Online is going to be the place that people come to talk about this book in particular for very obvious reasons. Um, but at the same time, like we're trying to keep it away from like there is one thread looking to create a hyper competitive list. But I think in reality, um, you simply the system is so complicated and the way that terrain and line of sight works is so absolute that I think there's a lot of uh, rules designed to prevent you from making an objectively good Banner of the World Dragon um, style netlist. Um, yeah. So I think just get creative with it would be my advice. Yeah. I think you're right. I, I've been looking at some tournament lists that won tournaments, you know, and you look at them and it's like, this is no different from any list that I've yeah, designed, yeah. really. It's just a bunch of units, it's a bunch of characters, and more, more or less people are using the same magic items. People are pretty you know, smart about which ones to pick. And I, I think it's honestly coming down to generalship, which is really encouraging. Like uh, these lists don't look crazy. It doesn't look like they have some secret tech that they're employing that you're not seeing. It, they really just look very normal and ordinary, which is yeah. good. I and I mean, and Warhammer yeah. Fantasy Battles has never been a great tournament game anyway. It's never, it, it's, 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 a, it's a too much of a, it's too gritty. There's too much going on. There's too much nuance. Age of Sigma, not my favorite game in the world. But it's a better tournament game. Because don't, because, don't tell them that though. But no, but it's written, it's written <laughs> in that way that yeah. it has no soul. <laughs> it is a game. Yeah. It's all about whether things are yeah. wholly within five inches and all that kind of stuff. And it's all about it's basically it's, it's games workshops take on war machine and hordes, isn't it? It's it's a game of bubbles with buffs and debuffs and and stacking special abilities and heroes with uh, all this it's it's a very, very different system. And I think it lends itself almost in the same way that like a card playing game does i think in many ways age of sigmar is i think it is a much more gamey game a gamer's game you know it's a it's a game that can be exploited and in fact it's designed to be exploited it's designed for getting that battle tome working out the nastiest combo of of buffs and debuffs and making sure that you know you smash someone's face in whereas i think warhammer fantasy battles at its core or the old world now at its core is a game that is a tabletop battle simulator and and i think that's where it really really shines and yeah you can have tournaments of of warham fantasy battles but i think it really really shines between people playing narrative games people playing fun games people using their little toy miniatures to tell a story well and maybe just to underline that point right when when we surveyed the cdo community um four out of five players are going to play in casual settings um, but less than one in five players intends to play in formal settings. Now, that doesn't mean that either of those groups are invalid, but I think it's important to remember that most people are making their way through 253 pages of rules with their friends intending to have fun. Um, and I think, and hey, that, Ken, this is, this, is, um, this is the thing that we have to realise online generally, is that the competitive crowd um, are a very vocal minority. In war, well, they have a lot to talk about. They have a exactly lot of complex that. decisions. Exactly that. Whereas the casual gamer is less likely to start a a YouTube channel um, going into deep dives on the rules and all that kind of stuff, you know, because they're a casual gamer. The very nature of them makes them casual, but they are a a much more represented group, but probably not represented online as much. 
It's a funny thing too, right? Because uh, honestly, this tournament that I just talked about was the first tournament that I went to in, in my life mm -hmm. for Warhammer. So, um, but prior to that, even even when I wasn't going to any tournaments and I really was playing casual just with friends or pick up stores, uh, pick up games at stores, um, even though I'm not a super big gamer, I think I think people still want to build their list with the with the you know the army list in mind. Uh, you know, select models that are strong and and have an, at least a concept in their head that I'm building a strong army that will is the, that can compete on the battlefield. Uh, even even if you're just a hobbyist, I feel like that's still a, a core tenant of how you go about the Warhammer experience. You you look at the list, you build the list. A lot, you know, a lot of people will buy these army books and never play a game, but they're using it as a sort of formal structure or skeleton for the building process of their own. Yeah, and, and it's something that they spend a lot of money on. Um, and so, you know, I have a lot of empathy for it. I think you want to, you don't want to find yourself pantsless in that way that I think some of the AOS and modern 40K things have made people scared that it's possible to spend, you know, up to $1,000 on uh, an army list that next year turns out to have been a waste of money, right? Fundamentally, a, a, an army list that gives you a negative play experience because you you don't get to interact with the other guy because he just shoots you off the table or whatever. That said, there is probably no play style more casual for the old world than not playing it. Um, and Jared, I just wondered, Reva, if you wanted to kind of weigh in on on uh, what it is that kind of is keeping you on the the sidelines. Because God knows you've got some big square based armies, right? Um, but I'm just curious, what, what systems are you going to be using them for and, and how are you feeling about uh, Tau? What made you into the titular Brian these, this time around? So I think firstly, uh, I am very excited for what this is bringing to the forum. I think that we've, we've had the you know rising tides raise all ships thing for a long time. Any new system is going to bring us traffic and ultimately all I want is more showcase blogs on the forum. So that'll be achieved regardless, <laughs> uh, which I think is, is really great news. Or bring a lot of attention to the forum in a lot of good ways, especially recently. So that's incredibly positive. Um, as far as gaming goes, I don't really have a reliable uh, way to get games in. Uh, if I were to get games in, it's going to be something on along the lines of More Time or Battlefleet Gothic or Man of War. I would say uh, as soon as I get Man of War painted, um, it's more my speed in general. Uh, I don't really have anything local. Uh, and, transporting even a, a smaller army for it told the, the the old world's probably just not something i'm going to do um so that's most of it uh, i'd say most of my older gaming buddies are all um pretty stuck in in a good way uh, you know very committed to some of those older systems um so we, we tend to, to lean towards that and and build for it um, my chaos source are very much a hobby project for me um they've not seen a table admittedly um which i'm very okay with uh definitely been more of the hobby hero style for for quite a while so um uh, doesn't really bother me in any way and i if i were to play the old world um i would only play with somebody who didn't require me to to to, to rebase or uh and to be honest as some some people know i put my models on 22 and a half millimeter bases so um they don't fit in any system anyway uh but I would only be playing in a casual setting regardless. That, that's so punk rock. That is so punk rock, Reva. Just like, fuck your old system, fuck your new system. <laughs> you, you could still pretty easily actually make movement tray spacers using 3D printing technology. Yeah, I mean, I have a printer, but uh, I'm not doing it. Frankly. But I mean, it was, it was nice. It was nice to see <laughs> GW openly saying, guys, if you're playing in a casual setting, who gives a shit about base sizes? And they said that on Warhammer Community, right, through an official channel, because they're trying to encourage people to not completely lose their shit over, like, something that is very marginal, right? But I think, you know, across the board, one of the things that interests me, and just one last point I wanted to make about the rules, the old world is a big, unwieldy system that will take a large community a long time to figure out the nuances of, right? People you're playing with are going to make mistakes because the mental load of the system is very high. But Warhammer Army's projects, the Ninth Age, even Cal, these are not systems that are going to go away because of the old world, because these are systems that have faster updates and community control 
that mean that you can be on a Discord server talking to the guy who writes the rules and telling him how what he's done is unbalanced. Tau is never going to have that. It is going to need a community addition to fix it in the way that old systems had before it could be that performant. And from that perspective, I would advise people to just like play it to have fun and don't do any of the dumb stuff you hear about on the internet because the truth is that like the old world is not going to get balance changes. So if you discover something unbalanced, just don't be a dick about it. Yeah, absolutely. That that is that is a massive thing. I mean, the the the, the meme that was going around from um uh Dr. Black Seal for a time, wasn't it? Was the Lionhammer thing. And it's like yeah. one, I think there's quite a few answers to Lionhammer. But two, if you found out there's a way to play the game that looks really, really shit and ruins everybody's fun, probably don't do it. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a case of you're going to get play one game against someone, and guess what? They're not going to want to play against you anymore. That's not a way to make friends. Um, I love Dr. Luke's videos. I've been watching all of them. Um, he dropped one today, in fact, uh, about um, uh, Stillmania, Nigel Stillman's sort of <laughs> rules for making an army and, and, and functioning, functioning in the war. Yeah. Yeah. Free, free, co free codes to gloss, never touch it again. <laughs> yeah. And it's a really cool subject. If you want to look it up, yeah, I love but it, I, yeah. I think, I think the point that Reaver also made that we haven't really talked about yet was base size increases. How does everyone feel about base size increases? I know for myself, aesthetically, when I'm, I've built essentially two full armies in the new base size, and I really, really like it. <laughs> I love having 25 millimeters to, to, to base my guys. It's been so awesome. The shift from my chaos warriors from 25s to thirties also felt really good. The cavalry, uh, you know, 25, 25 by 50, they say 25 by 50, but it's actually like 23 by 50. Oh, that's games bases. workshop bases are a nightmare for that, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now that they're on 30 by 60, it's really nice. There's a lots of space and aesthetically I'm really liking it. I think maybe the only things that maybe could have remained on twenties were something like night goblins or novel. Night goblins come up a lot. But I really, I really like everything else universally. I think the space is so much better. I think it just allows you so much more creative freedom when you're making your miniatures. And if you're, you know, if you're a Chaos Doors fan. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Night, Night Goblins freedom. are the ones that are most regularly referenced because those Battle for Skull Pass goblins that have been doing arounds now for, well, since the start of the CDO days. Yep. They're very they, yep. Yeah, they are very, very small. They're much smaller than their Sixth Edition counterparts. And, I, and, and honestly, I have. I have a bunch of sixth edition ones. I probably have two hundred and fifty night goblins. Yeah, based. yeah, but they were always a nightmare to do on twenties, weren't they? I mean, actually, talking of that, being a fan of the old uh, big hatted chaos dwarfs as well, they are a bloody nightmare to get onto twenties. They never fit. They never fit in yeah. nineteen ninety four. Twenty mils was too small. For right. Them. Yeah. You know how you used to have the the slot of base where you know there's the the crease or the hole in the base. Uh, it's on one side more than the yeah. other. So what you would end up doing is you would have one rank of guys on the left side, and then you'd flip the base around and have the other set of guys <laughs> on the right side, and you could kind of stagger you had to together. Do it. But it was always a mess, and it barely worked. Or, or ever, everyone was just standing on a, a complete diagonal, right, on the, on the other kind of slot of base. I think I've really enjoyed um, being able to have big hat cast dwarfs just standing facing forward. They don't all have to be stood at a 45-degree angle. Yeah, yeah. I think we can all see why they made the change. So it, it, it was sense. Have you guys rebased much? No. And I'm not going to. Oxy, have you done any rebasing of your guys? So I, um, I went, this was kind of just, just before your triumphant return to the forum, um, Xander, there, there were like stages of mourning and acceptance for me around the old world, <laughs> where I was the guy on the forum going, I'm not playing a living game. Um, call me Reva, if you will. <laughs> And um, <laughs> and and then I then went, all right, maybe I will use my old armies in it, but I'm not doing anything new. And then I went straight to, oh, my God, this is the best thing that's ever happened. I'm buying new miniatures and I'm rebasing all my armies. <laughs> so I've been through lots and lots of stages with this. So I, I don't think you have to rebase. I really don't, especially if you're playing in settings like I'm playing. I did play a couple of games with my Chaos Warriors before they were rebased, and it made marginal differences to the games. They might have been slightly better at some things and slightly worse at other things. I've now rebased my um, rebased my Chaos Warriors, 
and I've been rebasing my big hat chaos dwarfs. But my big hat chaos dwarfs, you have to understand, were on circles to begin with. My mm. 1980s style chaos dwarfs were on 20 millimeter squares, and they're staying on 20 millimeter squares. It's a massive project, and I think that project might be done now. You know, it's a, it's a decent two and a half thousand point army, and I'm, and I'm quite happy with that that project, as it were. Who knows? I might come back to it one day. Yeah, I took a very interesting and sort of similar trajectory to you with respect to the game coming out. I thought, oh, you know, I'll start a new army, and all my new armies I'll I'll base on the new base sizes, so Dark Elves. And I always planned to do my Warriors of Chaos for whatever new game came out, so I did those two. And then for my existing Chaos Dwarves, I took a sort of a different strategy. I said, I'm not going to rebase any of my infantry. All the stuff on 20 mils, that's fine. I'll make movement trace basers, and that'll be good. And the stuff that's not on 20, 20 mil bases, so all the monsters or the artillery, those have never really had a coherent base size to begin yeah. with. You know, that th- so I, I, I updated all my monsters and all my war machines for my army that I'm going to take to Adepticon, but then I've got spacers for the infantry. So that's the sort of halfway that I've gone for my old army for Chaos Dwarves. And I think it's... It's working for me, and I'm pretty. My, my orcs are in spaces, so I started an orc project where I was taking Age of Sigmar crawl boy orcs from the Dominion box, to kind of Lord of the Ringsy looking orcs, and I was turning them into a fancy army. And I'd started to that project maybe about six or seven months before the old world, and where I'd invested quite a bit of time to building and started painting and stuff, I thought, no, you're not getting rebased because you're halfway through. I was quite happy to go back and rebase an old army. I was quite happy to rebase. Uh, to, to, to start a new army on new bases but a project I was halfway through it just felt like taking too many steps backwards there is something cathartic and weird and sort of it's like a rite of passage to rebase an entire army for some games workshop product there's something strange about it, it always seems to happen no matter what game you're playing <laughs> <laughs> everything everything gets changed. like whether it's moving from you know 5th edition fantasy to 6th where everyone decided that goblin green bases were out and, you know, dirt brown bases were in and you'd have to repaint everything. <laughs> you know, there's always something that's going on at a meta level where everyone's deciding something and everyone has to sort of just follow suit. It's I'll really tell you what I do like about rebasing, I found this with my Chaos Warriors army, is that um, it allowed me to maybe make their bases a bit more coherent and better than I'd done them the first time around, where that was an army that had grown really slowly. It started as an Age of Sigmar army, then became an 8th Ed fantasy army. And... Um, my painting developed quite a bit during my time painting them. So there is, there's, there's variety in the models in terms of their quality. But their actual bases themselves, there are some bases that were a bit ropey. Uh, like, they're, they're based on snow, right? And I think when I first done it, I was like, they're in the snow, so their base will be snow. But then you do that, and it just looks like they're standing on, on a white platform. Whereas, you know, as time has gone on, I've, <laughs> my mate John talks to me a lot about always have three colours on a base. You know, so if you're going to have snow, mm. have snow on the rocks with maybe the odd little flower popping up or something. And it just makes it pop a little bit more, you know. Um, so yeah. now that I've rebased them, I think they look like a more coherent and higher quality army. Nice. So you conveniently left out your arc, Jack, of when you went into uh, learning an entirely new software on the computer to do custom movement trays. You forgot that little that little tidbit of your your progression to the old world. Yeah, Reeve, I've had so many weird phases in my life, I can't remember them all. <laughs> for those unaware, we have a great tutorial on Chaos Force Online for making your own custom movement trays with free software. Just DM me yeah. if you need any help. Yeah. It's the way to go. And absolutely. Do you know, the, fun, the funniest thing about it, Reeve, is I wouldn't know how to do it now. I'd have to read that tutorial again. That was, that was like a mad weekend. <laughs> That's why you make the tutorial, though, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of Reavers tutorials are ones I keep going back to. Lava bases being one of them. I'm gonna do. I think I said this on the forum, Reaver. I'm gonna do a lava base tutorial of my own soon because I started by trying to emulate yours years ago, but I've kind of slowly kind of created my own version of it, which is um. Yeah, I think I think I'll be able to share. As always with, with my my tutorials, Reaver, it will take half the time of yours and look half as good, but people might still like it. <laughs> <laughs> It's better than taking double the time and looking. Yeah, at exactly that. I'm, I'm quite content with being quicker and worse. It'd be, it'd be worse if I was slower and worse. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's, 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 it's great that, um, you know, we've got this old world game, but um, quite a lot of people are going to be coming back into the hobby or, or joining the hobby mm-hmm. for the first time. And, um, uh, Zandi, you, you've, you've come up with a, 
a kind of new initiative in in Chaos Dwarfs Online. This this is the hashtag Dark Forged that you've been working on. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about this project? Absolutely. So I just feel like, you know, I can't be the only one who's really excited that Warhammer's back. And one of the things that I sort of noted as soon as the launch happened was that, hey, there's a lot of legacy factions here. And, you know, whereas we used to be kind of like the only legacy faction that was kind of around and we were kind of like the ugly stepchild or something. But now, I mean, we're in the same company as Dark yeah. Elves, Ogres, Skaven. Like these are huge mainstays. And we're now on the same level as all of these other armies. And we're just one option among many. And really the only thing preventing people from starting Chaos Dwarf armies is the miniatures, which means there's a huge opportunity for our community to really uh, rally behind, you know, our army as a concept and make it easily available to everyone to have all these resources, you know, whether it's whether it's third party miniatures or, or you know, printable resin 3D sculpts. There's just, there's just so much opportunity for our community to come together and and encourage and and provide just the resources for everyone who wants to make a Chaos Dwarf army to make one. And so this campaign that I that I'm spearheading, Dark Forged 2024, is really to to make that easier or or at least provide motivation for people to start a Chaos Dwarf army to say, hey, look, you're not alone. There's tons of people doing this. It's not as hard as it looks. And so really the way I've broken down the project is, you know, the goal would be to build an old world army in 2024. And the way we're going to approach that is you take it month by month, you choose a unit and you complete the unit from start to finish inside that month. And for each step that you, that you finish, you know, that's a little check, check mark off on a box where that'll get you like a raffle ticket to some prize draws that we'll be doing. And really, it's just to provide a sort of a framework. So, you know, in March, uh, we can, we'll focus on core units, and whether that's a single core unit or if you want to do more, you could. You know, you want to do the assembly portion. So if you, if you assemble a whole core choice, boom, that's, that's one checkbox off. And that's one raffle ticket for, you know, possible prizes. If you manage to paint that whole unit, boom, that's another check mark, and, you know, another raffle ticket, essentially. Um, the other categories we have to finish are basing or movement tray. Uh, you know, writing up some lore for the unit that you've created, playing a battle that maybe incorporates that unit, a battle per month seems feasible. And then we also have a bonus category um, where there's all, all sorts of things you could be doing to encourage people in, in the game or in your army. So we've got things like introduce someone to the game. That could be your bonus for the month or paint, uh, build and paint a piece of terrain, you know, that maybe is Chaos Dwarf themed or try out a new painting technique, post a battle report on the forum or the Discord or something, you know, build and paint a unit filler, host or take part in an event, convince a friend to join the forum, something like this. We have a whole list of bonus challenges. And one of the other things you can do is, you know, maybe you you have an existing Chaos Dwarf army. You're not building one from scratch, so you feel like you can't participate possibly. Well, the idea is, you know, if you've already assembled and painted your, your unit, but you really want to have you know play the old world you maybe you have to rebase it still or come up with some new lore you still have to play a game or do the bonus but if you've already done the assembly step and the painting step well you can swap those out for another bonus uh you know for that month so that you could essentially get the same number of raffle tickets as anyone else who's assembling a new army so we're trying to keep it nice and fair and balanced and really it's just about motivating people to to engage with the community, to build, to paint, and to play the game, and to really enjoy all the different facets of what make our hobby really fun. And I just feel like with the launch of the new game, it just made sense to have a campaign that we can point to and say, hey, you know, we're doing something over here, and, and we think you should be a part of it, and you're going to get so many benefits, you know, the community, the resources, everything that we've been doing since 2007 is going to be available to you. And I think it's just this huge opportunity. So, you know, I, I created a brand new website for for the community with a, with a campaign page and everything. So I'm really focused on on sort of the branding of Chaos Dwarfs Online and where we can take this now that we've got like a solid game that we that we can all participate in. And uh, so that's my pitch uh, for this campaign, Dark Forge. And I've got, you know, we're trying to incorporate social media into it too. So it's like hashtag Dark Forged 2024. 
and a bit about the name. I feel like this there's this cool new word that they've been using as a keyword, right? It's dark forged weapons yeah, yeah. and dark forged armor and stuff. And it just seems to have this really cool, like it really matches with the lore, I think, of the army. You know, there were these evil forge masters. And I think it was just a cool little word that I could play off of and, and, and engage with, with the whole community with. Uh, absolutely. And, and it's something I've been getting involved in. In fact, as we are, um, as we are literally talking now, Xander, I'm putting the finishing touches on my March Core unit, which is a unit of 10 uh, Castle Wolf blunderbusses. That's yeah, awesome. I'm, 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 I'm currently actually moved on to the movement tray because in my head, they will not be complete until the movement tray is also painted. I'm, I'm quite a firm believer in that these days. It's something I've moved over to. <laughs> um, I want... Yeah, and that is part of it, right? Like there's this whole gamut and, and that's why we kind of had to want you would have the, each these stages that you could complete optionally or not. But like basing or the movement tray, that's a big part of what makes a Warhammer unit look like a Warhammer unit. So I, I never, I feel like a unit is never complete until it's got that that settled. There's two big benefits to to Dark Forge, right? One is um, it will help motivate people, which is the same thing with Batchy and all the other kind of things that that we do year round. Um, to understand what it is to post on CDO and to get experience getting compliments in a positive hobby community and then maybe to kind of for people to try their hand at starting their own blog. And I think blogs are really where the site shines because people engage in their own, you know, mixed process of painting and kit bashing and getting ideas and getting feedback just on an ongoing basis. And then I think the other advantage to it is that what we're kind of going to see is a huge showcase of all the different places you can get Chaos Dwarf models now. Since GW are continuing to abstain from selling them to people for money, uh, and I think we all know that a made to order would sell out in a heartbeat, um, but I'd rather they not do that because we've got tons of really great third-party alternatives. And having initiatives like this will get people to showcase just a really wide variety um, so that people understand how realistic it is to collect their own Chaos Dwarfs in the aesthetic that they like. So, Jack, I was taking a look at your whips for those blunderbusses. Mm. Um, and they're kind of a, a mix of 3D prints, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be, I'll be talking about these a little bit later on. But, yeah, they are um, all what I would describe as, like, classic big hat miniatures, but they're not all classic miniatures. We've got some old models with some modern models and some obscure models, but they're all... Of that aesthetic, right? And and I th I guess I should also mention that um, you know it's this is a long project, right? Building an army is a long project, so we've broken it into months, and so for each of the months, there's a theme, right? So for March, it's going to be core. April, it's going to be heroes. May, special. June, rare. July, war machine, and then August, monster or centerpiece or something like that. And and by having this structure, you know. We're really trying to encourage the assembly of a complete army, as I said. And another sort of bonus thing that we're going to maybe try to tack on to the end, uh, it's a bit unplanned for now, but, you know, right around the fall is when Games Workshop has its big Armies on Parade celebration. So we're encouraging anyone who's got, you know, an official GW model army, or at least some portion of their army that is official, you know, that at maybe in September we'll we'll talk about doing, you know, the, the two by two, two foot by two foot uh, army display boards and and really try to get as many armies if we, as we can uh, to contribute to armies on parade for chaos dwarves to try to send a signal to games workshop that hey people are playing chaos dwarves in a big way it's still a huge thing and uh, so this is the first year that armies on parade is going to feature the old world so if we make some kind of push in that direction that could also be really cool for the community sweet um and i think i guess one thing that we actually didn't discuss weirdly enough is the the things that have come back into the chaos dwarf roster as of this army list that weren't in the chaos dwarf mm -hmm. roster back in eighth edition and um and that does include old classics from the 90s right like it was extremely respectful i think of gw to put sneaky gits in there which were not in tamakan yeah um, but black orcs right. in there which again were not in tamakan because the only book they can have been reading to motivate them to do that is obviously um the 1994 white dwarf presents warhammer army's chaos Wars, which means they've been thinking about big hats and we know that creative assembly have been kind of 
part of that dialogue with them. And so they will have kind of inspired them to reassess that range and take it a bit more seriously. Um, but I think that means there's a lot of depth and breadth to the project because there are so many different things in core beyond Infernal Guard. And I think the other thing that's nice is that in the PDF law, GW have reopened the way to say that Infernal Guard don't have to be wearing a tin hat. Do you know what I mean? They can be wearing a big hat. Um, and that means the aesthetic choice um, is is all there for people, right? If you want to make it look entirely 90s, that's legit. If you want to make it look entirely Tamakan, that's legit. There's nothing stopping you on either front. Yeah, I think we haven't talked. You're right. We didn't really give a our sort of analysis or a review of the Chaos Dwarf list itself. And I think, like you're saying, I think it's a perfect synthesis. It's sort of like what we were, what we saw with Total War, you know, three Warhammer, um, where they've got this really cohesive vision of what Chaos Dwarfs can be. You know, it's not just you know Infernal Guard, but it's also Chaos War Dwarfs warriors with with hats. And now, yeah, like you said, we got green skins back. We got hobgoblin bolt throwers. We got we got everything you could need. Like you could even make a mostly hobgoblin army, which is kind of rad. Yeah, you almost and can legally. And with, with, with a push in a friendly game, you absolutely could do a hobgoblin army. Um, legally, I think you need to have some infernal guard in there. But yeah, I think if you're playing around your buddy's shed, absolutely you can make an. You can make also, a also just now. just build some tough looking hobgoblins and take them with the infernal guard stack. That, that's exactly what I was thinking. Exactly, right? You have some heavily armored hobgoblins. There you go. And perfect. Yeah, counts as. Counts as. That's your friend. Oh, but guys, but think, guys, they've got base strength four to... on the Infernal Guard. There's no basic Chaos Dwarf <laughs> Warriors. Sure, they're, they're just called crewmen now. <laughs> <laughs> they've got strength three. But, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of flexibility with the list. I think it's really, I think it's really awesome. I think we're going to see a lot of cool lists and just cool armies that people build as a result of being of having access to all these different unit types i think it's there's that one thing this one caveat you know you were talking about how it's great that we're including all these units and you know there's an eye towards previous editions the one thing that seems sort of left out of that is the earth shaker in terms of its base size um there's no included base size for for the um Oh, geez, what's it called? The new one? Uh, the, dread, the Dreadquake, which is just a giant earth shaker, isn't it? From Tamakan. Dreadquake Mortar, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's on this giant train. And if you actually look at the footprint of that giant It's like model, the biggest it's, base size in. It's so yeah. big. Yeah. It's like, I mean, the minimum base size you could probably squeeze into it is something like 40 by, geez, I don't even know. It's like 100. I think it, I think it starts with a two. It's like. Look, I'm, I'm, Sorry, the, the one that I shared on the uh, on the the competition this week, the the big cannon of corn that I've done. That's going to be my earth shaker because it's it's bloody massive. It's nowhere near as big as the four one, but it is. It's a brick, but it is massive. But I, I think you know, I think the community just needs to kind of have an answer to that and just say make it sensible. Stick on the big. I mean, bones, you know, you know yeah. part of the reason GW haven't done it is because they're like, well, if you've got one, use it. And if you're proxying, we're not allowed to talk about that. So we're not going to tell you what size it should be. That's it. And you're not going to turn up to a, a Nottingham event. You might find that the independent comps, you know, people like Triple Crown and stuff might come up yeah, with they'll introduce a it. suggested base size or a range of... Because yeah. like, Giants have two base sizes now, don't they? Yeah, that's why I was disappointed, right? Because you saw other units that are like, you know... Um, Warriors of Chaos, Demonic Seed, where it's like 50 by 50 minimum, or maybe 50 by 75. Yeah, exactly that. Which is kind of cool, because you can run it next to some Dragon Ogres, and it's got the same base size, that's kind of nice. Um, or whatever. But f I just wish they did that for this Earthshaker, uh, Dreadquake Mortar, because my mine is modeled around the look of, it's like halfway between a Hell Cannon and an Earthshaker, yeah. so it's the footprint is way small, and mm. I think the base size that I have them on right now is, geez, what is it? It's like... I want to say like 80 by 80 or something, but you know, it's not as humongous as the hell cannon, but it's not quite as elongated as the dreadquake mortar. So yeah, I'm thinking of that. I should build a footprint for it um, to bring with me to Adepticon just in case anyone's like, that's not a siege quick you know, mortar or whatever. And then I can just plunk down this crappy stupid base and put my guy on top of it and just say, well, here's the footprint, I guess. I would say if it'll make you happy. But yeah, I would say like it's worth prompting that conversation because tournament organizers have got so many things to be worried about that I think 
we have a responsibility to be ambassadors for our faction in that environment. And I do think your thinking just sounds totally legit, Sandra. Like what you want to be doing is showing them a, a unit that's basically the same, that has a defined base size, like the Iron Demon, for instance, and saying, I'm just using the same base yeah. size as that, you know? Yeah. And all of this to say, there's lots of activity and excitement happening for the old world. So join the campaign that we're working on, Dark Forge 2024. Show off your army, get some feedback. You know, you'll have a place on the forum where your army blog can live forever. You can link to it from your Facebook, from your, your Instagram, from whatever. You know, if, if, you're, if you're more used to using Facebook or social media, it's, it's nice to have a non-transient permanent place where your army blog can live that you can link to rather than, you know, have, you know making a post in a Facebook group it where gets lost, doesn't you know, it? people see it for a day or two and then, yeah, it just gets lost forever. So uh, I think those are the advantages of, of still posting in forums. So I, I really encourage everyone to, to join the forum. If, you, if you're listening and you are not a part of it, maybe you're just on the Discord or something, join the forum and share some pictures. It's really easy to upload uh, in the discourse software that we use for the forum. And uh, it's really easy to upload from your phone. Take pictures from your phone, upload from your phone. It's really simple. Uh, I re recently upped the cap. We had like a cap of five images at a time to upload. I've, I've blown that up to like 20 or something. So there shouldn't be any problem uploading pictures. Take as many pictures as you want. Upload, upload it to your forum post and, you know, get some feedback. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think we all... Um would would suggest anyone who's trying to get into the old world or or wants to get into collecting chaos dwarfs a really really good a solid way of doing that and a way of finding a community very very quickly is is getting involved in chaos dwarfs online's dark forge campaign old returners and new gamers alike uh, there is a question though that needs to be answered which is every one of the supported factions are going to be getting models for them of the unsupported factions, they have Age of Sigmar equivalents that are very easy to port over and use. Chaos Dwarfs are of a unique position where we are going to be one of the unsupported factions that isn't even remotely supported by a main line range of miniatures by Games Workshop. So unless we have classic miniatures in our collections already, or we're willing to trawl eBay and pay those prices, anything but goldfish blue people don't do it we have to come up with options of our own of how are we going to collect cows dwarfs how are we going to source and find miniatures and i was hoping that tonight we could maybe share some ideas from us on a podcast what are the ranges out there that people can tap into what are the ranges people could use uh, is anyone in particular want to kick off this discussion sure i'll start so i i think there's tons of ways you want you can go with just if you want to stay official right if you want to use games workshop products and you want to go that way there's still tons of options for you i think i think the most recent you know, most recent f fantasy dwarf models were like the iron breakers and the long beards that kit is really nice it's uh totally you know you could totally convert from that i think even the the caradron overlords from aos are really cool they've got a lot of more technological looking aesthetics so there's tons of stuff you can adapt from Games Workshop stuff. I think that's totally acceptable. And if you want to stay, you know, tournament ready for a Games Workshop event, that's the way to go. Um, the alternative, obviously, is these third-party miniatures. And one that I wanted to draw attention to, which I haven't checked out for years, but I've been looking up recently, is uh, a, a range of dark dwarves from Mom Miniatures. And so I'll, I'll have a link in the show notes or whatever where you can check these out. But they've got a pretty decent little range that's got some really excellent looking dark dwarves that are kind of like a blend between the new, the, the Legion of Asgore eighth edition looking aesthetic and also a little bit third edition. They've got helmets and beards and big circle shields and they've got centaur, you know, bull centaurs. They've got a death rocket. They've got some really cool, like golem looking guys. They've even got this, like they call their chaos sorcerers viziers. So they've got a vizier, like a, it's like a chariot being pulled by fiery looking bulls and they've got a couple other sorcerer models and it's just a really cool line of miniatures and one of the problems you know that we're seeing everywhere is that a bunch of them a bunch of these different unit types are out of stock but they do have a notify when available you can put your email address in there 
And it would be really cool if we could all put in our email address in there because I really want to get a unit of these dark dwarves. You know, it's it's twenty six pounds for a unit of of twenty 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 chaos dwarves. I mean, it says it's on twenty mil bases, but um, maybe they're change. We could maybe I'll email them see if they could change that. But um, just really cool. I've never seen a lot of them out in the wild painted, and I would love to see some support for this range. It's it's really cool, and uh, I think it's it's a perfect fit for uh, the old world. Do you know, I feel like it's, it's a very cool range. It's a range I haven't really kind of seen represented out in the wild, as it were. I haven't seen them much mm -hmm. on forums. I've definitely not seen them on tables, but I've seen them online. They do look awesome. They look very, very cool. Anyone else got any suggestions of, of, of Chaos Dwarf ranges that are currently available that people could tap into? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. I, I do want to say, I'm pretty sure I have the Mom Minis uh, Vizier. I don't have the Chariot, but uh, I think they have an on foot variant as well. Yeah, yeah they really, have really good, really good pickup of the. I, love I have the regiment, and I really recommend it as well, especially if you like Infernal Guard of the Tamakam era. Yeah, yep. Um, other than that, I would say uh, old school minis uh, is is a great look. Uh, on the forum, we've had a lot of engagement with with Jamie over at uh, old school minis. Uh, he's sponsored a few of our contests in the past, and even uh, some of our art contests have uh, fed into his uh, concept art mill and and got cranked out by sculptors to be uh to be models there i don't know if that's gone through the full casting release yet but i know it was um we've seen the greens uh so he's uh, been a really great collaborator uh for the forum um i've been th uh let's see i think i've been through two of his kickstarters at this point uh but i think most of his business model now will just be through uh, through his online store uh, which i've also ordered from and had really good experiences with um Right now, I'm working on a couple units of boar centaurs, which uh, Zod will be very pleased with when I actually finish them. He's uh, outpaced me on that by uh, probably a year or two by the time I finish. Zod outpaces us all, man. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, but yeah, they're great sculpts. Metal minis, if, uh, if that's your thing. Um, good, good range of Chaos Dwarf. Infantry, uh, ranged, close combat centaurs. Uh, yeah, uh, everything I've uh, uh, I've got from there has been. I'm just checking them out yeah. now on their website. It looks like it's under Ewall Devergar if you're looking it up. Yeah, and they also have some things in in other. Uh, I'd encourage anybody to browse the rest of the site as well. Um, for those into kind of different demonic creatures or anything, there's even some uh, wastelands um, miniatures that are yes. good pickups. Yeah. Um, I have. Some snail riders. Um, I've got a whale mutant that I'll use as kind of a base filler. Um, he fits on about two forty mil bases, um, which is very fun. Uh, so yeah, I, yeah, I'd encourage anybody just to browse the whole site. Uh, you never know what you're going to find there. Uh, lots of different kind of aesthetics and and a general actually unified aesthetic of helms uh, in the Castorf section. So, um, yeah. T take a look and uh you know maybe we'll uh we'll see more from from jamie on the forum he does poke his head in uh from time to time good so his recommendation um chits what what would what would you be recommending to to listeners so you know me anyone who's listened to the old shows uh knows that i love a hobgoblin and i love a hobgoblin of the classic style um so if you are looking for an affordable option in that range and something that looks 90s um but doesn't cost the earth then max mini which is actually the mini design and sales arm of uh troll freighter which is a big used um warhammer emporium um do these incredible bundle deals so they have a goblin army for 125 pounds that ships for free globally um if you look at the aesthetic of it they've all got the big tall hats that you would associate with a hot goblin now, there's some units in there, because obviously it's intended to be run against the green skin list. There's some units in the big bundle that you won't need. So you won't need the wolf chariots because they're not legal. Um, you won't need the shamans because they don't exist. But everyone knows that a Chaos Dwarf Second Army is going to be green skins. So there's an advantage there. But to be exact, they do a unit of two bolt throws for £15. Pounds. Um, they do a regiment of uh, sneaky gits, which look exactly like classic sneaky gits for like 12 pounds for 10. Um, you know, we're talking about like one pound, one pound 20 a mini. 
um, which is great. They have the classic hand weapon and bow options, obviously, for the infantry. And then if you want to expand it to a themed list, uh, then you've got everything you need, but you've got both types of wolf rider, which means you can take them um, in the style that they're kind of intended to be used when you're using the Chaos Dwarf Army. Um, it's not an amazing range for Black Orcs. Um, they have one Orc regiment. They are wearing armor, but it's like chain mail. So it's not perfect for that. Um, but on the whole, yeah, if you want to solve all your Hobgoblin shopping needs in one place, then I recommend Max Mini for it. The units are called Goblin, by the way. They don't use the word Hobgoblin. They just call them Goblins. Yeah, they're arranged. Um, I, I'm not massively familiar with the with the Goblin range of bears, but they are a a company that I've become increasingly aware of as a supplier of miniatures. And you can't kind of beat their value. Those army box sets are they're a proper army in a box. It's not like a start collecting. It's like you've bought an army, isn't it? Yeah, I was looking at their Tomb Kings one, and although it's missing a certain set of utility pieces, they really do like to give you one of everything yeah. um, and then bundle it all together. And I think the truth is, since the vast majority of people are playing in, in non-GW environments, these minis are directly intended to be the unit roster of the old world or equivalent Warhammer Fantasy copies. And from that perspective, you've got your foot and mounted Khans covered. You've got your all of the um, weapon options available on the Hobgoblins are covered by that range. And then when you're paying that little, realistically, the only thing that's cheaper is if you're already a friendship. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, the, the ranges that I'd like to talk about today um, is mostly because I've been trying to... Um, with this current project for the old world, do my big hat army. The big hat army I originally wanted to do for Age of Sigma, but kind of fell by the wayside a tiny bit, kind of reinvigorate and re bring that back, that idea of, of, of that big hat army. And um, I love the original um, big hat Chaos Dwarf range, but as, as people, collectors will know, they're not the easiest models to kind of get hold of. I mean, there are ways, but they are not the easiest models to get hold of. Um, However, there are two Chaos Dwarf online forum users who have really filled that that space as it were. So I'd like to talk about Fabozel and I'd like to talk about Brawniak. Um, so Fabozel a couple of years ago started sharing um, sculpts on Thingiverse that he was creating of the original Big Hat Warriors. I think he started off with a single warrior um, and it was very, very heavily inspired by the big hats to the point that when you stick a Fabazel model next to a big hat, it almost could be from the same range. Since then, he's, he's had a Patreon, which has, which has really, really grown in scope that he now has almost every single unit from the Chaos Dwarf. Now, his, his units are a little bit more based on the Ravening Hordes list, you know, the kind of White Dwarf Presents list. But um, almost every single model from that range kind of represented there, you know, including things like the Lamassu and Sorcerers and all that kind of stuff. That that patron, from what I understand, is starting to come to an end now. Um, and and Fabazel has very, very graciously said that he's going to be giving um, sculpts to the community once the project is finished. You know, his, his patron is very much like an early bird. You know, you pay a little bit of money to support the artist and you, you get the models before general release. Um, he also has tiers where people can be official sellers. So if you jump on Etsy and look up Chaos Dwarf, I guarantee within the first 10 um, items that come up, there'll be at least four or five of them will be his miniatures. And they're really, really, really cool. And they're, they're really, really available. I, I don't own a resin 3D printer anymore, but I'm able to easily, through Etsy, buy these, these models, you know, a pound or two each. And it's, it's a really nice way to be able to build an army. Uh, more recently in our community, Brawniak has been um, going down the same path that Fabazel started to tread a couple of years ago. He started off by sharing his kind of work in progress Chaos Dwarfs that he was creating um, through an early copy of Alzine and on our Discord server. And that's now kind of grown into a life of its own and has spawned its own Patreon as well. And it's really nice now that um, we've got Brawniak kind of treading the same path as Fabazel, which means we have double the sculpts for the same units. And I have in front of me right now a, uh, a Brawniak um, Chaos Dwarf Warrior and a, and a Fabazel Chaos Dwarf Warrior. They look perfect. They can totally stand next to each other. And Brawniak's got great humour in his models as well. Some of them are very cheeky and funny. He's got one which is the uh, the Chaos Dwarf Blunderer, who's uh, 
blunderbuss has clearly backfired and it's kind of exploded out like a Looney Tunes weapon. It's all sprayed open. He sat down looking dizzy with his hat at a funny angle. Great fun stuff. You can have his little unit fillers and stuff to put in the units. But um, there are definitely two ranges that I'm going to be leaning on quite heavily to pad out the Games Workshop models I own. I own Games Workshop big hats, but not enough to, to run a 2,000 point army. So it's going to be great to be able to use those alongside some of my old Zonk models to kind of create an army that's quite cohesive. Although it's from four um, producers of models, quite a cohesive look overall. And I think they'd be the main, the main ones I'd be recommending today. Is it, is it worth telling people what Zonk was and explaining to them how you can get Zonk now? The saga that is Zonk. Um, so quite a long time ago on the forum, a user appeared going by the name of Zonk and he shared um, some metal um, big hats that he had sculpted, well, were greens that he had sculpted. And they were in the vein of the big hats, 1990s Chaos Dwarf miniatures. Um, by today's standards, I would say the Zonk models are, are a bit rough around the edges they are i've literally just been painting some while we've been talking here and i've got them next to some fabozels and i can tell you they are they are a bit ropey in comparison but um you have to understand that this is in a time that this was happening that was before 3d printing that before there was widely available third-party chaos dwarf miniatures and so he kind of really really cornered the market there um, however, what happened was, was he offered to sell these models to people on Chaos Dwarfs online forum, and it turned out to be a scam. I think only the first handful of people who um, got the miniatures, um, oh, sorry, the first handful of people who ordered miniatures actually got them. The second wave sent this man the money, and then they never got their miniatures. And then he ended up kind of deleting his account and running sort of thing, and it turned out that it was a big scam, and a lot of people had lost money and stuff over it. And he'd scammed, he'd, he'd done the scam before, right, to Dark Elf Forum or something. From what we understand, yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd appeared on different forums. It was kind of a thing that he was doing at the time, turning up to forums, sculpting these models and buggering off sort of thing. Um, but then what happened was, was a handful of Chaos Dwarf online forum users um, who, who, who will go unnamed, although they are absolute heroes in our community, will go unnamed because it's a, a murky grey area when you're ripping off a rip-off merch, and I'm not quite sure where that, where that lands. Um, they took some of his models and they recast them in metal and they were then renamed the um, Karma is a bitch, kind of like as a one big chaos dwarfy looking word, Karma is a bitch dwarfs, where they were then re-released for the community. That's how I got my first songs in metal, would have been very, very soon after joining the forum. I was put into contact with the, the user who was able to get me Karma dwarfs and I picked up a unit of 10 Karma dwarf um, blunderbusses. But the saga continues. Um, so if you look up um, Zonk Chaos Dwarfs, there are now three STLs of those dwarfs available to be downloaded and printed. So now half of my Zonks are metals and half of my Zonks are resin prints. And, and I can tell you now, because I've got a metal one I've painted tonight and a, and a resin one I've painted tonight, the differences between them are barely imperceptible, you know, are barely perceptible. You might find it's a tiny bit softer depending on the quality of your printer and stuff, but, but they'll, they'll, they'll look absolutely great. You know, I've definitely passed a free foot test. I was going to say table distance. Yeah. Well, I think it's important. I think it's important because, you know, you can get them for free, right? And and that's the key thing. Like, Grawnia goes a modest fee, um, and I think he will probably keep it that way, but you can talk to him. He's very open on, on Discord and on Discord, and you can interact with him quite happily. Marco um, is a public member of the community. There's even a Patreon tier where you can ask him to sculpt something specifically for you. Well, I was saying quite often Marco Brauniak will do um, sculpting on Discord. So occasionally he'll log on Discord and go, oh, I'm sculpting some dwarfs tonight. Does anyone want to watch? And he'll, let, he'll, have, he'll have the users uh, log on and watch him sculpt these things from scratch, which is a fascinating process to watch. It is, but you know, it, it, it makes the 90s very affordable. Because if you, ha let's say you have a handful of original 90s sculpts that you got off the internet, fine, right? But you, you can't repeat those 10 times. If you combine those three sources of STLs, then you can have something that looks uniform, but has a lot of variety in it. And I guess that's the army that you're building on your blog now, Jack, right? Just going to say, if you want to know what that looks like in the flesh, guys, go on Chaos Dwarfs Online, look up uh, Oximandeus for Mad, and yeah, you'll see literally that project being played up. Bravo. 
Well, that's four good options. It is, and I think you know we're 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 a really really good position now uh, as a community where there are still DIY options available to create cows to farming. But likewise, we have we are actually spoiled for choice as to how you can create cows to wharfs now. When we look back at when the forum was created, 2007, I don't know if you know this, Xander, we often refer to it as the Battle for Skull Pass days. That's totally yeah. what it was, yeah. So when we look back at the Battle for Skull Pass days, DIY was the main route of doing this. And that's still a fantastic route and, and a well-trod path, but it doesn't have to be anymore. There are so many different ways for people to get into cows to wharfs, to start collecting cows to wharfs, and there's never been a better time to do it. Now, as Xander points out, we're on equal footing. Uh, we're just as maligned as, as lizard men and Skaven now. <laughs> Everyone's been dragged down to yeah. our level. Or, or we've been, you know, we've been elevated somewhat too. If you compare our PDF list that we have now versus the PDF list that was released with Ravening Hordes and Sixth Edition, it's not even a comparison. It, it feels like a complete oh, code. Absolutely, you've is. got all of the. You've got the lore text on the side of each unit. You've got all the options you could wish for. You've got a full, you know, lore of Hashat, and you've got all the magic items. And it just, it feels, it looks like any other, any other army out there. So I think, like you said, we're really on an equal footing and it's best awesome. time to do it. So, uh, boys and girls, the best place to, to get involved in all of this, to get involved in the Dark Forge campaign, to get involved in, um, starting a blog to get involved in getting inspired by chaos to wolf miniatures chaos to wolf fan art chaos to wolf lore uh narrative all of those sorts of things the place to do that is chaos to wolves online so look us up google us chaos to wolves online you'll find our discourse forum the discourse forum is the real beating heart of our community where you will find our blogs and you will find our our uh, legacy of content going all the way back to 2007 uh, and for more kind of um, up-to-date and chit-chat sort of things we also have a discord server as well which you'll find linked on our website on cast dwarfs so yeah look us up and and we hope to see you there well i mean i'll also say that you know we're also on instagram if instagram's your thing i know instagram's been a big part of my hobby for like the last five or six years so we're on instagram we're on twitter we're on facebook we're trying to you know coalesce around the forum for sure but we're on all these other platforms and we're also doing weekly hobby hangouts now we're trying to organize this for wednesday uh we just had our third week which was on wednesday this week um and we're just we're just hanging out on wednesday nights um it's typically around 8 p.m in the americas for eastern time and i think they're also trying to set up a central european 8 p.m slot as well with with jasco um, but yeah, on Wednesday, you know, see if you can book some time on Wednesday and just come and hang out, do some miniature stuff. You know, you don't have to be on camera. You don't even have to say that much. But if you want to just hang out and listen to the chat while you while you do some miniatures, uh, that would be awesome. And it's a, it's a great place to share what you're doing for Dark Forged 2024. And uh, just you know, if you want some feedback, real time feedback on your miniatures or painting or anything, uh, I'm dedicating myself to being there Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, for for the foreseeable future, I've got it scheduled in my calendar. I've told my wife about it. <laughs> it's the important thing, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all, all the normal things you do. And uh, you know, I'm going to be working because I, I've been doing so much hobby lately that I figured I would just set aside one night a week where I can be sure that I can engage with other people. So, really want to plug that right there. But uh, aside from that, yeah, it's just a great time to do chaos dwarf stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think on that note, we'll say good night. Thank you for listening, and we will catch you all soon, we hope, on our next podcast. Ta-da!